Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, we are resuming the regular meetings now under the title of the Tricontinental Quantum Fundamental Seminar. Um, I've invited Robert Johnson from Nordita, the Nordic Institute of Technology, to um, sorry, Nordic Institute of Theoretical Physics, to give a talk on um, Gaussian states, partner modes, and entanglement duality. Um, Please uh, take it away, uh, mm -hmm. Robert. Let's see. Just have to move some boxes away. Zoom is. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, now, uh, I was trying to, do you, do you see the slides well like this? Uh, yeah, yep. I, I think that works. Okay, good. Great. Then, Once I'll move the last boxes out of the way. Uh, oh, sorry, I didn't hear that. Nothing of relevance, go ahead. Okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah, then thank you everybody uh, for having me. Uh, thank you, Evan, for the invitation. Um, well, you mentioned the title, uh, Gaussian states, partner modes, and entanglement duality. What's that going to be about? Well, I'll try to get across to you, uh, I think, three main uh, takeaways or take-homes um, on this topic. The first one would be that I want in this talk to uh, showcase maybe um, the scalar structure formalism for Gaussian states. I think it's super useful. Why? Because you can treat fermions and bosons usually in parallel it's the same thinking when you work with them you see very clearly uh, the geometrical structures that underlie gaussian states and it's also practical in the sense that it's super safe i don't know when i first learned gaussian states with matrices i was never quite sure if that matrix has to, had to be transposed on the right or inverted and well if you use this notation you put your indices you put indices onto the objects in the right places you can never build illegal uh, expressions any longer so super safe to use i love that the second uh, big takeaway would be uh, the entanglement structure of gaussian states that's maybe uh, the bit that is most relevant i i, I would guess when i go and talk outside of rqi uh, the community because in our uh, community i think uh, well it's well known by th this concept of partner modes but maybe it doesn't hurt to repeat and also point out it just works just the same way for um fermionic Gaussian states. So this will be the statement that, uh, yeah, inside of pure Gaussian states, the entanglement structure that you get when you introduce by partitions is really easy and neat to understand. It will look like just in this cartoon. And of course, I uh, want to share, talk, um, also showcase to you some um, article that we, uh, this, this article here, on an entanglement duality in supersymmetric Gaussian states, which I did with Lukas Hackel, now also uh, in uh, Australia, and Krishanu Rauchaduri. And uh, well, in other versions of this talk, in, like I, I once put supersymmetry directly in the title, and I think I could read from the reactions of people that maybe that wasn't a wise choice because some maybe came with too high expectations on you know, how supersymmetric that would be. And I'm not sure if it also turned off other people who don't know anything about supersymmetry. And uh, the reason is like, this isn't a super, a super, super symmetric talk. In fact, all that I know and that we will need for this talk on supersymmetry, I uh, can share with you on just one slide, uh, the next page. So I'd say we get started with that. Um, in particular, since I don't see you, like, I mean, if you have questions, please always ask them. So maybe we have some interaction interspersed in the talk. I only see my slides. That's a little weird. Well, it is what it is. So what do I mean by a free supersymmetric system? <clears throat> uh, the thing that I'm going to talk about today is basically nothing but the sum of one quadratic fermionic Hamiltonian and one quadratic bosonic Hamiltonian. Uh, well, how do you get those? Um, what you do is you take a supercharge. This is operator Q. We'll talk about it in a second. <clears throat> you square it. 
The supercharge is a is a bilinear operator contains fermionic and bosonic um, uh, observables. You square this thing, you use anti-commutation and commutation relations to the end, and what you find is your Hamiltonian is now a sum of a fermionic Hamiltonian and a bosonic quadratic Hamiltonian. And you see directly one particular the property of these, this, these two Hamiltonians is, well, they have the same number of modes and the omegas are the same. So the excitation energies of uh, fermionic eigenmodes and bosonic eigenmodes, they match pairwise, right? So if you were to put this uh, system here now in the ground state of that Hamiltonian, the vacuum state, these uh, vac vacuum uh, the vacuum energies would exactly cancel because you get a negative contribution from each fermionic mode, which cancels out the positive contribution from uh, the bosonic dual mode. And this cancellation, I guess, was exactly exactly why uh, supersymmetry was uh, introduced, invented in high energy physics originally. But then it's also been used to solve certain quantum mechanical models. And in fact, uh, Krishanu, who brought this up, or who, who, yeah, whose idea is about to, to start this collaboration. Um, he worked in sort of material design or quantum material research, where the idea is, well, if you have a cool fermionic lattice, would you be able by such constructions that you sort of look like a pat for a parent supercharge, would you be able to find bosonic, bosonic Hamiltonians, which have a similar, I mean, we share those properties, but maybe you can design these. Um, right, I basically said it already. What is the supercharge? It's, I mean, uh, you would write it down like this and find all the objects again that you know from elsewhere. Uh, it is an operator which is bilinear in fermionic and bosonic operators. So we have here Majorana operators acting on the fermionic bit. These operators anti commute. We have on the right hand side bosonic operators. These are here quadrature operators or Qs and Ps with the canonical anti commutation, uh, canonical commutation relations. And in the middle, you put a uh, real matrix 2n by 2n. And you know, you would square it out as usual and get, for example, this expression for um, the supercharge if you spell it out. And this thing you can square, and then you will find a Hamiltonian like this. Now, since these are two quadratic Hamiltonians, what's the ground state of this thing? It's going to be a Gaussian state, which is just the product of the fermionic vacuum state on the one side, on the left side, and um, the bosonic uh, ground state, which, which is a Gaussian state on the right-hand side. That's going to be a motto throughout the talk. Uh, fermions on the left side, bosons on the right-hand side of the slide. So what then are we looking at here? Well, if we have um, such a supersymmetric system and we put it in its ground state, then the supercharge gives us a way to also identify subsystems on one side with subsystems on the other side. What could I do for this? Well, I could take two, uh, Q, uh, two bosonic operators like here, which define a bosonic mode in the system, and I can commute them with the, anti uh, with the supercharge and what I get is a pair of uh, Majorana operators, which define a fermionic mode. Vice versa, I could have taken any two Majorana operators and, uh, yeah, um, well, not any, we will see that at the end of the talk, but generically I can take two Majorana operators, which define a mode over here, and I can anti-commute them with the, um, with the supercharge, and I would get back to operators two bosonic operators, which can define a subsystem in the bosonic system. So what we were interested in was the question, well, if I take a subsystem like here, so more than just two operators, but an entire um, subsystem on one side, and I use this map, this uh, the supercharge, to identify it with a dual subsystem over in the bosonic partner system. Mm. What happens to entanglement entropy under this map, right? If this is a lattice like I sketched here, indicated here, um, we know that I do a cutout like this. I can have entanglement er entanglement between the inside A and the rest of the system. So now if I look over here at the dual system that I've defined here, um, 
what how large will the entanglement of this subsystem be with the rest of its of the bosonic system well if we only pick one mode basically like i did here the map will look something like this uh, the relation between the two um we have here on the axis a parameter lambda we will talk about it later but important is that lambda equals to one um uh, means your mode is in a pure state and in fact this map maps pure uh, modes in a pure state to modes in a pure state um I should have said this maybe what what would this thing do to your energy eigenmodes well it will map energy eigenmodes with uh, one omega say omega two on one side to the eigenmode of omega two on the other side right so for example this identification maps energy eigenmodes to energy eigenmodes. But now if I take some other mode, which is not an energy eigenmode, so it can have entanglement with the rest of the system, um, then this parameter here, lambda, which runs from one to zero, will give you um, uh, will give you the entanglement entropy. In fact, that's what I've plotted here. So we see the blue line of fermion, lambda equals one, is in a pure state. And then if I go let lambda go down to zero, it goes up to maximal entanglement. And uh, if I now look at the uh, von Neumann entropy of the bosonic dual mode to this, well, this graph looks like this. Now the point, oh yeah, so at this, this would be the first point for uh, audience interaction. Do you at this point have a guess for what this relation will be? I mean, just looking at this graph. And I'm happy to share that I'm, of course, at this point, expecting you to not have a good idea of what this uh, function could be, because in just about, let's say, 15 to 20 minutes, I'm sure that all of you will guess exactly right what the uh, neat relation underlying this, um, this plot here is. So with that bold statement, I would now continue with a bit where uh, I introduce, give a basic overview of the uh, uh, this Kähler <clears throat> structure formalism, and um, would then in the middle come to the to the uh, entanglement structure of Gaussian states. So the cool takeaway, but part of mode, and you being able to well exactly guess right what under what relation underlies this. <clears throat> okay. Then I go on. So, um, I mean, Gaussian states are all over physics and all different fields, and there are different efficient ways of treating them. Um, and this one here that is, uses the fact that Gaussian states define Kähler structures on phase space. Um, also, this one has been developed, I guess, in several over, over several decades or starting with different groups. Um, but a neat and recent review on this is by Lucas Hackel and Eugenio Bianchi. Um, this archive uh, identifier here. I think that maybe the first people to look at this were people in quantum gravity or quantum theory and curve space times um, by Ashtika and so on, I think. Or if you look into the Wald book, also there, um, basically it's exactly that same formalism. So it comes from many places. It's just that I, I mean, well, I would use this. For obvious reasons, uh, this one is the reference. So the notation here will look similar to what we find there. Okay, um, <clears throat> when we're looking at um, at the states, then uh, Gaussian states, um, we start actually off with classical phase space. So in phase space for uh, this is a typo. Of course, it's only n degrees of freedom. Is uh, so I'm sorry about the two here. Shouldn't be there. I put the hand n degrees of freedom. Well, that's R to the two n, right? It's real dimensional two n with n two n dimensions, and of course, um, because this is so much lower in dimension than the full quantum mechanical Hilbert space, that's why Gaussian states are easy. So, a classical state is a point in this vector space, um, a classical state, and what are then linear observables? Well, it's some a map that takes a state and returns you a number, so it is and is it's linear. So linear observables are elements in the dual of this vector space. And what I will be using today is abstract index notation. This is what makes the index nota uh, the notation of this formalism so safe to use, the thing that I mentioned at the beginning. So 
whereas I may not be consistent whether I assign Latin or Roman letter, uh, Latin or Greek, that is two um, objects, I will be consistent with where I put the indices. If an object carries one index upstairs, well, then it's a vector, an element in V. If it carries one element down, uh, one index downstairs, then it is a linear observable, an element of V star. And it, I mean, this works, is this, or is this thing that you maybe know from GR uh, courses or, or notation? Um, this allows me just to write, well, I, when I apply V to omega, I'll just write it like this and I contract over indices that appear twice, one upstairs, one downstairs. Now we want to do quantum theory. So we need to be able to assign to linear observables operators on quantum mechanical Hilbert space. This is what the quantization map does for us. It gets a hat to remind us that we're now dealing with quantum um, observables with, with um, operators which may not commute. Um, but it carries an index downstairs and that is to tell us that it eats vectors, uh, that it eats linear observables and returns us linear operators on quantum mechanical Hilbert space H. Um, right, and whereas this maybe looks very abstra abstract, um, I guess this you would all recognize, right? This is a Q hat, so this is quadrature operator. What's behind that? Well, this is what I get when I apply the quantization map to the classical linear observable corresponding to this operator. And this is another equivalent way of writing it. <clears throat> or if we had already vector matrix representation on the previous pages, well, there you could represent this quantization map by um, this vector where you write in your your quadrature operators for your basis modes as a vector and then you would be able to write down a quadratic observable a hamiltonian like this you have this two form in the middle which is represented by a matrix you put the vectors corresponding to the um, quantization map to the left and the right you multiply everything out and you get your usual expressions back right and the thing to go from index notation to matrix and vector representation is to make sure well that it's always that the indices that are multi that are contracted over always come next to each other. So we would have to move this psi here to the left. Um, now, if we look, if um, if the, the the important ingredient, if we work with uh, whether um, which decides whether we work with Fermions and bosons are of course anti-commutation versus commutation relations, right? So they define what what they do is. So both of them, they define so-called stru structural forms on V star. So for what I mean by this is for fermions, we have anti-commutation relations, and they look like this. They tell us that if we anti-commute um, the quantization maps, then what we get is actually a symmetric, a, a metric, in fact, a symmetric positive definite um, form on the linear observables. Right, it's we would represent the anti-commutation relations by the identity matrix, for example. That's what's behind here. For bosons, we have commutation relations. So if we look at the commutator of the quantization map with itself, we get a symplect the symplectic form back, and that is, as we know, an anti-symmetric um, bilinear form on the linear observables. And what we do in physics is we always want to work in canonical bases. Right, we want. To, and th these are the ones which give, uh, which put these forms respectively into their standard form, which is the identity matrix for the metric, or for fermions, the identity matrix for G. And for bosons, it's, well, they're different orderings, but basically this would be the one of the two standards to put the symplectic form in. And physical transformations then, unitary time evolution, or passive or active transformations in quantum optics, all, all these things, what we uh, what we require them to be is, of course, that these are transformations which keep the, this shape of the structural forms invariant. That means that for bosons, we only allow for symplectic transformations because they are such that they maintain this shape. And for fermions, this would correspond to orthogonal transformations because they maintain the shape of the metric. Now, this was all about structure and nothing about a state yet. If we have a quantum state on such a system defined, then we can characterize it at, by, by its two-point function. I mean, we can calculate the two-point function for any state. It's sort of like the first non-trivial information. 
And of course, what is the special thing about Gaussian state is that this already contains all the information you need to fully characterize the state. What's the two-point function then? Well, you can define the two-point function like this. You just look at the expectation value of two entries of the quantization map with itself. And if you look at this form, again, it's a two, well, a map which takes two uh, linear observables, it returns your number. Um, then you can split it up in its symmetric and its anti-symmetric part. And now if you're working with fermions, for example, then the symmetric part is already determined by the anti-commutation relations. Oops, sorry, by the anti-commutation relations up there. So for fermions, it's the anti-symmetric part, which you know takes the job of the covariance matrix and characterizes the correlations in your state. For bosons, it's the other way around. There, the anti-symmetric bit <clears throat> through the commutation relations is all is the same for any state, but it's the symmetric part <clears throat> which takes the role on its, as a covariance matrix and characterizes the state for you. And what happens here, so if we put it in this box, is um, whereas for bosons, omega is the structural form and G is the covariance matrix, if you want to go from bosons to fermions and you're thinking all you need to do is really just interchange the roles that G and omega play. Where for fermions, G is the structural form and omega tells you something about the state. And I just said it, Gaussian states, there are different equivalent definitions, but one of them would be that these are the states that are fully characterized by the covariance matrix and you have a Wicks theorem if you need higher order correlation or higher order punct, uh, point functions. And you can also say, define Gaussian states, that, that these are those states which are thermostates of quadratic Hamiltonians, where, of course, then temperature zero gives you pure Gaussian states. Or what you can do is you can look at omega G and contract it, them in a way so as to form a linear complex structure. And now we're getting to the scalar structure formalism um, with, in which you could also define Gaussian states as follows now. We've seen that the structural forms, omega and G, that they are non-degenerate. And that means I can invert them, right? Uh, think about this in terms of matrices. If omega and G, you represent them as a matrix, well, since they are non-degenerate, there exist inverse matrices, omega, lowercase omega, lowercase G. And they will be such that if you contract this way, you get the identity. So I think this is most easily understood in terms of matrices. And I only introduce these objects because they make the next, the definition of J look nice. So if you, um, well, if you define, if you have omega and G, and I mean, you know, one of them is your structural form, that's the one that you will invert, and the other one is your covariance matrix, then you can define the following object from it, right? If you are working with fermions, you take a covariance matrix and you put the inverse of the structural form next to it. If you're working with bosons, again, covariance matrix first, but there's an extra minus sign and the inverse of omega there. And now what happens is that for a pure Gaussian state, this is a linear complex structure on V. We see that it's a linear map from V just because how the matrices end up, right? You would put a vector from the right and you would get a vector here. But the interesting thing is if you square this map for constructed from a pure Gaussian state, then it squares to minus the identity. And on top of that, or I mean, together with that, due to this definition, we have that G, omega, and J define what is called the Kähler structure on, on the vector space. I give the mathematical definition just briefly on the next slide. Let's quickly, I mean, let's look first more physical at this. See if J squared, um, well, because what J really does, it, it encodes um, positive and negative frequency modes in your space. What do I mean by this? Well, if you have J and it squares to minus the identity, you can tell that J has eigenvalues minus and plus I. And if you now represent J, I mean, if you want to diagonalize J, but diagonalize J, what you have to go do is to go to the complexification of phase space. And there you can write down J as, you know, with the, um, with one eigenspace, which has uh, minus i as its eigenvalue, and the other one has plus i as, as, as its eigenvalue. And um, 
these eigenspaces correspond exactly to our creation and annihilation operators of that state. Right? The Gaussian state would be the ground state of some Hamiltonian, if it's pure. Um, right, and for for this Hamiltonian, if we do the if we um, look into the eigenmode operators, then the annihilation operators there, what they do is they annihilate the vacuum, and um, this is what is encoded here. Um, well, I sketched it here in the last line, the statement of, oh, look, this set of annihilation operators annihilates the state is uh, equivalent basically on saying, well, these are the observables you find in the, um, well, sort of the dual of um, the eigenspace of J with respect to minus I. So this is how it uh, connects together. I promised you, and this is just for completeness, really a quick definition of what Kähler structures are. Um, on a real vector space, a real vector space called a Kähler space if it is equipped with the following three Kähler structures. So you always have a metric, a so symmetric, positive, definite, and with the inverse GAB. You have a symplectic form. Symplectic form is anti-symmetric and non-degenerate, um, and therefore has an inverse, which we denote as before. And a Kähler space has a complex structure, and that's a map which you square to minus the identity. And these three objects, they need to be connected by this formula, which on the slide before I used actually to define J in the first place, or to introduce J to it. So if you have this definition fulfilled, then you have a Kela space. And it's this relation, which is also goes by the name of two out of three property. It means that whenever you have a Kela uh, structure and you have two objects given, then you can construct the third one. This works on the level of omega j and g. It also, for example, works on the level of the, the transformations. Like if you if you specify some the symplectic and the orthogonal transformation, which would um, a group which would or s o I guess uh, which would um, preserve your omega and g, then you already know what j you're working with, and so on. So there, there's a lot of neat math underlying underlying this. For practical purposes here, why? It's uh, nice to work with them as well, because the formula, the definition for J is the same for fermions and bosons. And then sort of you can think about your state in terms of J. And if you want to go from J to the covariance matrix, maybe to talk to other physicists, well, all what you need to do is really to just uh, contract it with your structure form from one side. And if it's, yeah, and that can be G or omega, depending on what, if you're working with fermions and bosons. That's the mathy side, or just for completeness. And um, now that I, I mean, now that I praise this object, I should maybe quickly convince you on that you can also actually write it down um, and tell you how you find it. So let's consider a bosonic Hamiltonian, chronotic Hamiltonian. Um, then, uh, well, we can look at the time evolution that this Hamiltonian defines. And that's given by the Schrodinger equation, which in the Heisenberg picture is looks like this, right? It's the commutator with the Hamiltonian, but gives you the time derivative of the quantization map. And now for the commutator here, you can use, um, or you can express this in terms of the symplectic form and the, I mean, you, you plug this definition in here in the commutator, you multiply things out, and then you're left with this expression, where you see it's omega times h, times uh, applied to the um, quantization map. And if you use this to define k as omega contracted with h, then we have k as the Hamiltonian generator. That's the generator of the Hamiltonian flow and phase space. Uh, so it's the simplest example is just, I mean, one harmonic oscillator mode with frequency omega. Here, h would look like this, diagonal omega in our standard form. So if we multiply these matrices together, we get k. Now, K, uh, the Hamiltonian generator, if you square it, you see that um, it has negative eigenvalues. Um, oh, so the sentence stands, well, it's a little weird, maybe. It, it has negative eigenvalues, and that means that K has pairs of imaginary eigenvalues, uh, minus plus I, omega I. And these omega I's are exactly the excitation energies of your Hamiltonian. 
So if you go and represent K with respect to the basis of eigenmode operators, well, you have a diagonal matrix and it looks like this. So it almost already looks like um, what we're looking for, which was J, which only had minus I and plus I and no omegas there. So really what you need to do if you want to find the J for your uh, for your given Hamiltonian is you calculate K and then, well, you just need to mod out or divide out these omegas. And what I hear briefly put into a simple uh, equation, of course, requires you to diagonalize the Hamiltonian and everything. So a bit of work is hiding under this. But in our neat example from above, um, that would look just like this. So in particular, if I, as I promised you, if I take J and I plug omega, contract it with omega from the right, I get back the covariance matrix. The same formulas apply for fermionic Hamiltonians. Fermionic, fermionic Hamiltonian would you find like this here with an anti-symmetric form. Again, you have the generator from the Heisenberg equation, and then you can apply the same formula to calculate J. This is, um, this would be the, the mathy bit of it. And um, so if I lost you here, this is where I would uh, invite you to come back because the next page is usually is very useful and does not even have to do anything with the math and then well except that maybe when i give the 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 proofs for it i would be using a bit of this formalism um because the next slide is the slide where i would like to review the entanglement structure of gaussian states so the setting is the following and um you notice that I drew this into the middle of the slide because it applies both to fermionic and bosonic <clears throat> Gaussian states. The setting is the following. If we have a pure Gaussian state, so you know, living in this box here, a state of many modes, and um, the system is in a pure Gaussian state, then we can go about and introduce any bipartition we want. And so this is an arbitrary bipartition of the system into two subsystems. Um, the modes, then when we start, I and mean, when we just do this, the modes, the individual modes can, of course, be correlated in many different ways, I have correlations in the covariance matrix in many different places, indicated here by these blue lines. Now, what I can do is, on each side of the system, I can do local transformations. So I can apply a lot of, well, yeah, local transformation, symplectic orthogonal, um, onto only subsystem I, uh, A, and to only the complement. And what I achieve by this is that um, afterwards, if I look at one of the modes that I've transformed myself to, either the, one of these modes is in a pure state on its own, so it's not correlated with any other mode, or if it is correlated with another mode in the system, well, then it's correlated with a partner mode on the other side of the bipartition and only one partner mode. So what you do is by finding these well normal modes of the covariance matrix on each side, is you um, is that you you can understand the entanglement across the bipartition that you introduced as really just being the sum of uh, two mode states, and each of these pairs is on a pure state on its own together. I mean, in a two mode pure state, in fact, it's just a two mode squeeze state that we would find there. Um. Now, how does this arise? This one can, uh, for example, derive in terms of of the um, of the linear complex structure that lies underneath the Gaussian state. And let's do this because it's also um, useful for later when we talk about what how to define subsystems. Because there, there's a little difference between fermions and bosons. Um, Right, because um, to whereas J would be defined for the whole um, as a linear complex structure on the whole on the whole system, where it uh, represents a pure state, so squares to minus the identity. If you want to characterize the mixed state that we obtained by after the bipartition and restriction to one subsystem, we have to restrict J onto that subsystem A, which we do by projectors uh, like like this. So we have to talk about when a subspace A of phase space defines a proper physical subsystem. And the requirement for that is, of course, that, well, if I restrict to that subspace, the structural forms need to look 
like those of a proper full like those of a proper physical system which means for fermions the only condition is that a has to have even dim dimensions because that is good enough for the restriction of g the structural form on it to still be an, an a, a metric well the evenness is for the so that you have modes and uh, for bosons it's a little more tricky tricky to check the, more tricky to check this because you want your symplectic form to still be non-degenerate in uh, on the subspace so again it needs to be a two n dimensional uh, an even dimensional subspace and mm -hmm. restriction needs to be non-degenerate and then what you do is um, if this is fulfilled then a can represent a, a physical subsystem of your original phase space and the um, complement would be um, would be uh, given by um, well you, you then have a direct sum decomposition of your phase space into a and the complement and the important bit is that this complement for fermions needs to be taken with respect to g the metric because it's a structural form and for bosons you take this direct sum decomposition with respect to omega uh, so that you have a symplectic complement appearing there and that means of course that omega and or g vice versa are block diagonal so if you look at omega between omega between vectors in a and bar a vanishes whereas here om vectors whereas here g between a and bar a vanishes right if you put this in place then you can for example show, show the following proposition uh, given a direct sum decomposition now i don't specify what kind of sum decomposition this is general if you have a direct sum decomposition of v and you have a linear complex structure on v then um you can what well, you can um, decompose j right in terms of uh, well using the projectors on these subspaces or in matrix notations looks like this that you have the restrictions on the diagonal and an off diagonal of the block j a b then those restrictions here j a and j b they if you square them then they are um spectrum inclus including the multiplicity is um exactly evil exactly even apart from eigenvalues which may be equal to minus one this is exactly the part the most structure if an eigenvalue is minus one this points toward a mode on one side being in a pure state on its own and they can be uh, different numbers um, but if it's different from one then there was this other the partner mode on the other side and that corresponds to an eigenvector of j squared with the same eigenvalue what does this look like for fermions and for bosons if you do a matrix representation of j well for fermions it looks like this um, you have these blocks on the diagonal and these are the individual like the, the marginals of um, basically or the restrictions to single modes so down here we see for example that was a pure mode because it has eigenvalue mine, uh, one and if you're different from one then i mean these double lines indicate the bipartition then there's a partner with exactly the same um cosine ri appearing here and these two are correlated by these sine blocks if we go from fermions to bosons instead of cosine and sine we have cosh and cinch appearing here but other than that the story is the same so if we summarize this um i told you that when we take a pure gaussian state we introduce an arbitrary repartition then we can by finding the normal modes on both sides we discover or uncover um this partner mode structure of the entanglement um i told you that the restriction of um the complex yeah if, if you restrict j i'll say j instead of always in your complex structure so if you restrict j to your subsystem um then your spectrum forms imaginary pairs plus i plus minus i lambdas and where these lambdas lie that's different for fermions and bosons um except for if they are one then in both cases this corresponds to a pure state for fermions then these lambdas because they are cosines rk the absolute value of that lies between one and zero where one is pure and zero is a maximally entangled um mode fermionic mode for bosons um again one is a pure state but because these lambdas are given by the cauch 
uh, cosine hyperbolicus of um, the R parameter, these can become infinitely large. And the larger they get, the more um, this mode is entangled with the rest of the system. And the entanglement entropy, for Neumann entropy of, of such a mode, or in fact a, a whole a subsystem, can be neatly um, expressed in terms of these lambda parameters or in terms of the spectrum, in terms of this neat compact formula, which really, which even is the same for fermions and bosons. So lambda, these lambdas of the restrictions encode the entanglement present in your subsystem, or the entanglement of your subsystem with the rest of the system. Where do these arise? Well, I told you examples for this that you can connect this to, if you know, I mean, to, to make this sound more familiar. In quantum optics, um, these two modes, I mean, in, in general, but partner modes are in a two mode squeeze states, just the same as we know them, for example, in quantum optics. In Bose Einstein condensates over the ground for Cooper pairs, you basically have again the same structure there, it's counter propagating modes. And, you know, the Rinder, uh, the Unruh effect is nothing but this story, really, uh, because when we take the vacuum of uh, the entire of Minkowski space time, and then we restrict ourselves to one Rindler wedge. Well, those normal modes on one Rindler wedge, these will correspond to the Rindler modes. And they are exactly this kind of partner mode entangled with the counter propagating Rindler modes on the other side. And I mean, yeah, after these nice three points, this fourth point really is obvious, shameless uh, self advertisement. But we also use this, um, for example, this, this thinking in terms of partner modes when we looked at the energy cost, the minimal energy cost of entanglement extraction from Gaussian states with Lucas in this work. Now, well, okay, I may. I have promised you too much. I think it took more than 30 minutes for you to, to, to get here, but we are now on the slide where you will guess basically and correctly um, this result of ours with Lucas and Christian on the entanglement duality in Gaussian states. The problem, the supersymmetric Gaussian states, the problem that I pose to you on the second, page, second slide or so. Remember the setup, right? We had, um, we had, um a supersymmetric Hamiltonian. So we had a system which was in the ground state uh, of a fermionic Hamiltonian, supersymmetric uh, fermionic quadratic Hamiltonian on the left and a bosonic on the right. And we had this map coming from the supercharge which, uh, which identifies subsystems on one side with subsystems on the other side. So the question is, well, if I go to one side, I introduce one bipartition so that I have five modes on one side, and then take these five modes and take the supercharge to identify a subsystem, the, the dual subsystem of five modes in the bosons. How will now the entanglement of uh, that we entanglement entropy that we have on this side be related to the entanglement entropy over there? Well, if we add the knowledge from the last three slides, then we know that on this side, the fermionic side, if we restrict the J of this ground state to uh, to the subsystem, we will have uh, values of lambda plus minus i lambda eigenvalues where this lambda runs between, runs between zero and one. And uh, on the bosonic side in this subsystem, if we restrict the bosonic fermionic structure to this subsystem uh, indicated by L of A, then again, it will have plus minus i lambdas as eigenvalues but they will lie between one and omega. And we know that we can calculate the entanglement entropy from these lambdas. The question thus comes down to how are these lambda i's uh, related? This is the point for true um, audience participation. I would need you to make some guesses or bets on how the spectrum, how this spectrum is related to this spectrum, how the lambdas here are related to those lambdas. This is not to put pressure on you, but like every other audience figured this out so far. And I've done this talk twice, I think, at least. Nico, Dominic, what do you think? Lucky?
Anyone have a guess? Like, just by the timing, it's clear that you're overthinking already. You know, we relate. To, we so need I mean, to yeah. I yeah, Nico's got a guess. What do you think? Yeah, it looked like reciprocal to me. Yeah. Reciprocal so divided, yeah. Yeah, it was, see, I, I knew you would get it. <laughs> yeah, isn't 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 that isn't, isn't that nice? That's exactly what happens. Huh. Wow. And of course, there's a bit of uh, I mean, there's a nice relation underlying this. Um, I will do it. Or th this page shows this relation just in terms of um, pure math, but you already sense the very connection to um, well, fermions and bosons. This phase, this slide is just formulated this duality in just you know abstractly. We have some vector space with the Kähler -like structure, and um, we have A as a, as a subspace in there such that you know it can be a proper. It can it could pro represent both a bosonic or a fermionic sus subsystem, right? Because it's even dimensional and omega A is non-degenerate on it. And I have this. Uh, so if I specify this A, I told you that there is, can be a difference whether you do the direct sum decomposition with respect to the orthogonal complement or the symplectic complement. And these two different sums here, they would give you different projectors back onto A, right? So we have now two different ways of restricting J onto our subspace A, and that they differ in whether we put the fermionic projector or the bosonic projector, so the orthogonal or the symplectic projector back here. And these two different restrictions of J they are related in this nice uh, way. So one is minus the inverse of the other. And then of course, if one has, uh, or if there's lambda in the spectrum of F, A of, of the fermionic restriction, well, then there is the inverse of it in the restriction of the, uh, or in the bosonic restriction of J. And exactly this uh, relation plugged in for um, one single mode, Gives you this relation here, right? So if this is if this is the complex structure of a single mode um, for for fermions with lambda between zero and one, well then this is the one of the bosonic dual. And if you plug this lambda into the formulas for the von Neumann entropies, you get the plots that I showed you on the first page. Um. Now this is was just abstractly in one in, in one vector space with the Kähler structure. What we have to, what I still have to show to you now, it, it would um, to tell you what, why it's enough to only work in one phase space here, and that's of course because uh, on the slide before we had separate phase spaces for bosons and fermions, um, but this page here happens only in one vector space, so we need to have a way of pulling one uh, phase space back onto the other, right, to identify them. And this is exactly the map that comes from the supercharge. So let me maybe not dwell too long on this, but uh, show you a little how, how you can cast a supersymmetric setup very nicely or straightforwardly in, um, into the Kähler structure formalism. Um, and you would also recognize, for example, is, well, yeah, let me show this. There's a few nice points along the way. I will skip the heavy formulas in view of time. Um, so how do we cast this Gaussian supersymmetric setup into the formalism for Gaussian states that I presented you today? Um, to distinguish fermionic phase space from bosonic phase space, there should not be a hat on here. I What I will do is I will put Latin indices for bosons and Greek indices for fermions, just to keep the, the forms, of, um, the different operators apart. For example, G alpha beta, that's now the fermionic structural form, the anti-commutation relations. Omega A B, that's the bosonic structural form, the symplectic transform, uh, the symplectic form. The supercharge then looks like this, right? It's linear and fermionic and bosonic operators. So it's a Q alpha A as a Greek and a Latin index because it maps and um, it goes from well, fermionic times bosonic phase space back to the real numbers. But that then means that, you know, we can, in order to calculate the supersymmetric Hamiltonian, we just write this thing, we, we calculate the square by writing this thing next to each self twice. 
And if we then use the omega, uh, the commutation and decommutation relations for this bit here, we end up exactly with the sum of a fermionic and a bosonic Hamiltonian. And uh, if we spell this out, then we get expressions for the fermionic and the bosonic uh, Hamiltonian forms, and they look like this. So the fermion one is Q times omega times Q transpose, and the bosonic one is Q transpose G times omega uh, Q. And if I know to the thing that I talked told you about the Hamiltonian generator, right? That I am there, I need to take the Hamiltonian and contract it with the symplectic for uh, with the structural form on both sides. Then I see that the Hamiltonian generator is uh, sorry, the fermionic Hamiltonian generator is GQ omega QT. The bosonic one is omega QT GQ. So you see that they have the structure that this is the the, the the um, product, say T1, T2, if we define T1 as G times Q. And this one is two times T1, if we define T2 as Q time, uh, omega times Q. And this here, for example, tells us that the two, the bosonic and fermionic system will have the same excitation energies, right? Because if you have operators A, B, and B, A, uh, like we have here, T1, T2, T2, T1, those have the same spectrum. Also, what we have is that T1 maps eigenvectors of KB to the eigenvectors of KF with the same uh, eigenvalue, right? So we have here already a map which takes, which does the identification um, that we want, for example, that it would map eigenvectors, uh, eigenmodes of one system to eigen, the corresponding eigenmodes of the other one. So these are already identification maps, but we, um, yeah like this and these, these are exactly the idea oh in fact i put it here in fact i put it here um these are exactly the identification maps that i talked to you that i present to you in the beginning where if you take a, a fermionic observable you can anti-commute it with a supercharge to get a bosonic one if you you know just to showcase how this formalism works out here's where you find t1 popping up at sgq as being the map that takes you from a fermionic to a bosonic observable. To work really conveniently with those, we need to do one step more. We need to normalize them. So if you take our T1s up there and we normalize them this way by the Hamiltonian generators, then actually we obtain maps, which if we multiply them together like this, L1, L2 gives you exactly the fermionic um, linear complex structure and L2, L1 gives exactly the bosonic linear structure. So you find, and I, this gets very mathy, so maybe, I mean, well, I don't see from the video if you like it or not, I think it's cute to see that you have um, basically this commuting di commutative diagram here, right? You can go from a subsystem on the bosonic side over to the fermions by L1, and then you can take L2 to go back into fermion into bosonic phase space. And what you achieve by this is that you have basically applied JB once, I mean, inside. And if you then do it again, you take again L1, L1 to go back to fermions and then L2 to go back to bosons. Well, you're right there where you started from because you've now applied JB twice and that squares to minus the identity. And it's now by these maps that we will identify fermionic phase space with bosonic phase space, or one way or the other. Point being, we can map the structures from one into the other and then apply the, the proposition that, that I showed you before. Because these maps, actually, but the, this gets very crowded maybe, but the, um, the main message here is that these maps L1 and L2, they exactly preserve um, G and omega when you map them from one side to the other. And that is despite the different roles that they take, right? So if we, um, what I want, what I want to say by this is that if we are in this ground state, which is a product state of the fermionic, the bosonic ground state of our Hamiltonian, then over for the fermions, um, for the fermions, well, G is the structural form, and omega encodes the the co the covariances of the state, the correlations in the state. But the thing is, we can obtain this covariance, fermionic covariance matrix 
by actually taking the bosonic covariance matrix and mapping it over either with the L1 or the L2 maps. They both do the same job. Um, they both do the same job. But over here, note that omega B is the commutation relations, the symplectic forms entirely state independent. So it's here, of course, encoded into L1 that you can take the structural form of one, pull it over to the other side, and then you get the covariance matrix. And the same works over for the Gs as well to get the bosonic covariance matrix. You can actually pull over the uh, structural form from the Fermions through these maps onto the bosons. And in particular, this also means that if you, you can use either of the maps and you can get the, uh, the restricted linear form onto your subsystem by pulling over the form from the other side from the dual system. And this then uh, is the relation. Uh, sorry, I'll just check something. Yeah, this then is the relation that underlies. And this and so in this relation then, well, it's exactly, I think, what we had, what, what underlies this duality, right? The, um, yeah, full stop. Now, some notes on this. Um, if you have a subsystem on one side, then of course also it's dual is a, a pure subsystem on one side, then also it's dual is a pure subsystem. And um, there is one case where this map doesn't work, and that is for maximally fermionic modes. Why is that? Well, maximal fermionic mode has lambda equals zero, so in fact the covariance matrix is just vanishing on it. Uh, on the partial, this, the diagonal block of that um, of that single mode covariance matrix is just vanishing. But then, as I told you, you get the um, the omega on the du uh, on the bosonic dual would be just pulling this zero matrix over to the other side. So of course, you would get a zero matrix there, and that is degenerate. So in particular, this omega cannot be any reasonable commutation relations. So um, so maximum entangled fermionic modes don't map over to a proper uh, bosonic dual on the other side. And uh, of course, this mapping gets worse and worse, the more entangled your fermionic, um, your fermionic mode is. And this last, this last uh, remark here is also underlies the sort of some plots that I wanted to finish uh, with. Um, and I mean, just to tell a story from from what happened to us when we looked started out and looked numerically at this, um, we looked at these lattices that I told you um, that I also had in the first page. And so on the left hand side we have a Kitaev honeycomb lattice, and um, on the right hand side we have a its bosonic partner. Here, actually, each dot, uh, black and white. Each dot corresponds to one Majorana operator. So here, a red link basically forms you one Majorana, uh, one fermionic mode. Over here, each white dot corresponds to one harmonic oscillator mode. So has Q and P on it. Now you can construct uh, you can construct these as partners from coming from one supercharge, and then you get uh, I mean these are nearest neighbor hopping mod or nearest neighbor coupling models and so on. So these are among the class which have entanglement area loss. What do I mean by that? If I go on the fermionic side and I, um, well, pick a sub system of region A, then it depends um, then how the entanglement entropy plotted here on a logarithm, double logarithmic plot scales while well, it scales with the, um, Basically, with the with with the area of um, the cutout that I made here, the prefactors can vary, and they depend on how, of course, or they they depend on how we um, how we arrange the couplings. You see that there are different couplings here. Maybe in the blue case, I guess this direction, yeah, this direction, the up pointing direction, would be the strong link, whereas the others only were weaker. Um, so we cut through strong links here for the blue case. 
And um, for the yellow case, we have less entanglement, with the same scaling, but overall less. And that's because we don't cut through strong links. The strong links are aligned like this, no, like this, so they never get cut through in this particular shape. But entanglement area law for both. And now if we map these subsystems over, we uh, checked and convinced ourselves that this map doesn't do crazy things. So it should not you know, suddenly give a totally delocalized subsystem or with the weird surface. No, this thing perhaps pretty local and pretty smooth. So we were expecting to find um, a neat entanglement area scaling the here for the dual bosonic systems as well. Although they were of course not sharp cutouts any longer. But here something happened uh, that first confused us a lot. In some cases, yes, we had an area law scaling, but in other cases, this blue case here, there the duals suddenly grew much faster and um, yeah, had something like a super area law scaling. And this confused us up until we found what I just told you last on the slide. Um, the thing that's going on here is that um, this comes about because we are here in the blue case cutting through almost maximally entangled um, edge modes that form along the strong links. But then we are in this problem that if you have an almost maximally entangled mode, and in fact, ah, you see this here, that in the blue case here, um, oops, where we where we cut through those maximally oh, those strong links in, in the fermionic one, what happens is that the total entanglement entropy inside of your cutout region, this goes with square root of m, where m is the number of modes inside of your region, that it's basically a square root of them, which carry maximum entanglement each, and therefore contribute to the to most of the of the entanglement of that region. But now, if we map these modes over to their dual modes in the bosonic subsystem, this thing happens, right? Where lambda here is close to zero, so the dual lambda b will be very large, and that's a highly squeezed state or yeah yeah a highly entangled state and that's why in this case where you try to cut through edge modes the entanglement of your dual boson boson bosonic system scales very differently um and probably that is just because it's actually not very physical to do that what you do when you do this mapping here is that you um i think sorry let me go you can tell it from here. What you do is somehow that something that maybe looks reasonable to for fermions, you um, scale it to something. Um, no, 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 sorry. I should uh, explain this in a calm sentence. The, the point is the, the following. If we have a maximally entangled mode on the almost maximally entangled mode on the fermions, its omega have, will have tiny entries. But if we map this over to the bosonic side, the omega stays uh, stays the same. That's the property I showed to you before that you can simply pull over the omega. But that means that, the, that after the identification, you have observables on the bosonic side, which have really, which you need to usually rescale because um, their commutator has this tiny lambda f in it. So what you do is you take these observables you divide them by one divided by the square root of this, which is already huge. And then you're looking at highly squeezed um, bosonic modes as the dual of your physically reasonable fermionic modes, just because they were maximally entangled. So although this looks cool, maybe it's just not so physical to do this. That's when I finally arrived at uh, the last slide with these physical pictures. Yeah, so thank you. These are the, um, these are the, um, this is the review uh, paper that I mentioned to you. This is the one about the entanglement duality. And this is a follow up where really mostly the colleagues on Ping Gong use this formalism to um, characterize supersymmetric uh, fermions and bosons in, in terms of their topological features. I'll bring it back in the screen. It'll create a little black box here.
Yes, we can ask some questions. In the meantime. Yeah, I see in the chat that Nick had to leave, but yeah. Yeah, that's uh that's uh super interesting. I was wondering, um well, okay, even if this would not be say necessary <laughs> to compute things, but would it even conceptually work to use this mapping? Um in the case, okay, I, I guess maybe I explain what I was wondering. So let's say you have um, some bosonic two-mode squeeze state that arises, for example, because you look at some thing like Rindler coordinates for uh, initially what was an inertial vacuum. Yeah. Um, and so let's say that then you formally map everything to fermionic case. And so you can find um, entanglement, uh, uh, or entropy of an, uh, subregions. Is this the same as if? So do we get? Um, so if if I just started from a fermionic field uh, in in Rindler coordinates, um, does you know th th does this diagram square back or um, or is there some uh, some caveat there? Ah, huh, yeah, I. Uh thought about how if one could apply this to field theory or if then you know also the supercharge or this relation as a geometrical uh, inter interpretation and so on and so maybe now that you say this maybe the unruh effect would be exactly a cool thing to look at um if one defines it for theories like this i mean i can quickly maybe re reply to this first in terms of a finite dimensional case like say on the lattice or so and then we can think what it means for the in a continuum when you you do a by per, yeah, they should be mapped exactly to each other, right? I mean, it would be in a case where we we start on one side, let's start on the bosonic side. We do a by partition, and then we have this one, we look at one pair of partner, mode, partner modes across that by partition. They will be mapped exactly to one pair of partner modes on the other side. And the lambdas would be related like this. So um almost pure like little entanglement to little entanglement and almost maximal entanglement on the fermionic side to huge entanglement on the bosonic side but so probably i mean the, um, group. yeah i guess the, the, question, is, uh, yeah. Yeah, I guess yeah, the only, I, I, the only I, question is if because i guess one uh starting from a fermionic field one can uh uh, probably straightforwardly derive <laughs> that maybe somebody of you have already looked at it because yeah the only thing I guess would be to check whether you get the same as uh, you would get just computing directly the Unruh effect for fermionic field maybe somebody has looked into that um, like it looked like it perhaps could be a useful trick because maybe there are many more results for bosonic fields and if they could be if one can identify that some effect is due to the underlying structure of modes, uh, yeah. then that would be quite a... Yeah, so I, I guess, uh, yeah, just the question then if to make sure that the interpretation is then that this would be the same phenomenon. Uh... So if we, pay, if we start on the bosonic side, we look into pair of Rindler modes and they have a large entanglement already, that means G has large diagonal entries. If yeah, G has large diagonal entries. We go over to the fermionic side, then omega and G will first look the same. So what we need to do is we need to scale down the linear, the Majorana operators, basically. So the duals of the A and A daggers by a lot so that G um that G is the identity matrix with respect to them. And that would, yeah, then press down this, the, the entries in omega, so as to lie close to zero. Does this work? Is there a simple quantum field? Like, can we just, I don't know, to define a simple supercharge as some field and you square them and then you have like the Hamiltonian density of <clears throat> our favorite Klein-Gordon field and it's uh, and the fermionic super symmetric dual yeah i guess that would be the question well perhaps 
I guess if one discretizes some theory, then it doesn't seem there should be anything wrong. I mean, because then it's um, okay. Yeah, maybe there's some caveat. I mean, I would I would be keen to 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 play with it a little bit, uh, but maybe I would also give air to other people to ask questions because we can uh, take it further here. Yeah. But the other people uh, won't have the chance to uh, to ask you just in the corridor. So. I was just thinking um, this this issue you had with the the fact that you the, the will land are very close to one. There's a yeah. break, breakdown in the area law for the bosonic um, modes. I'm th what I'm wondering is if that could be used as an, an advantage. Um, so I'm thinking of of, of modeling fields now and so tensor networks are, are often used to model states which have area laws mm -hmm. so if you have for example a, a bosonic conformal field theory which isn't down by an area law could you use this sort of map into a fermionic system where you do have an area law and then somehow take advantage of that to improve numerical efficiency Ooh, no idea but um uh, when you first said advantage i thought you know this would go into the side of implementations you know, physics to create cool states and they would have said no probably not because this is maybe just unphysical and the wrong observables but using this exactly for numerics yeah i mean i could see how it may help to bound something between zero and one which otherwise can grow infinitely large <laughs> mm. yeah maybe I mean, where it once was helpful for me actually was in improving, yeah, improving like some restriction theorems, like where can, yeah, uh, yeah, it's basically you look at, you have one Gaussian state, you restrict it to a subsystem and you ask, okay, where can the, where can the eigenvalues of this restriction lie? And then if you're on, we're dealing with fermions where you have orthogonal transformations, then this is the, what is it? or so or no well somebody's restriction theorem and it's easy in standard text because you know there you have orthogonal transformations but then for you want to do the same ask the same for the bosons then it's not so easy because you don't have really interlacing one of the eigenvalues can just lie above the other and so there are in fact wrong proofs out there in the literature <laughs> um but then with um there, this construction or using this form uh, was was helpful to rewrite this, and in fact was also the, done effectively the same way in in the correct version it's in the literature, the correct articles on this in the literature. Just saying this, so yeah, for for pure maths even or for proving stuff, this thinking has helped. I have um, not thought this through enough to give an, a useful reply directly to numerics, but. Yeah, why not? Right. Yeah, no. Okay. Any other questions? Well, I guess in that case, we should thank you, Robert. Thanks for the talk. Um, very heavy, but good. Thanks you for having me. That's good. All right. Yep. Then, uh, yep. See you. Okay. With, with some this, of you we very can, soon. Uh, we can wrap up. Um, thank you very much for, for giving the talk, Robert. Yep. Thank you. See you over there. Well, two of you. <laughs> the ones I see now, I see you over there. In yeah. a bit. Okay. Bye. See you. Um, just a little administration. Um, to our Swedish uh, colleagues.